On 12 News at 4, we are all about bringing you solutions and empowering you to better your lives. Every day, we bring some of the Valley's most experienced professionals to discuss trending topics on health, ways to save money and improve your financial life, the law, relationships, we even have an expert on pets. And it's not just us asking the questions, we give you, the viewer, the opportunity to weigh in and ask questions too. Now, we're putting all these segments together in one place for you. This is Ask the Expert. As we enter the summer months, many people are looking to change their diets, maybe eat a little bit healthier. And with so many claims online, it can be hard to tell what's actually true. So today we're taking a look at the science behind all of those viral claims. The expert is in the house, Dr. Sonal Harder. Thanks for being here today. She's with Dignity Health Medical Group. So let's get right to our first viral claim. One TikTok user saying it's always better to eat wild salmon rather than farm raised. Take a look. Farm-raised salmon we know has contaminants. PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, end up in the farm-raised salmon because of the pellets that they're fed. So I don't think there's ever a time to eat an Atlantic farm-raised salmon. If you're going to eat salmon, always eat wild. Okay, so is wild salmon better than farm-raised? Okay, so I'm gonna break this down. So wild salmon simply means that salmon that's found in natural habitat like oceans, rivers, and lakes. Farm-raised actually uses a process called aquaculture where they actually feed fish fish food, which is the pellets he's talking about. Uh, okay. So basically those pellets have some vegetable ingredients and some marine ingredients, protein and fat to feed the fish, right? Okay. And the wild salmon actually feeds no, normal like right. organisms uh, organic, around. Organic, yes. Correct. So little fish. The difference, when, you, when it comes down to health benefits, mm -hmm. they both are equally beneficial when it comes to getting your omega-3s. Omega and so American Heart Association recommends about two servings of salmon, wild or farm-raised, per week for everybody. Really? Now here are the nuances, little nuances. I tell people, buy what you feel like is convenient for you. So budget matters because right. wild salmon is more expensive than farm-raised. Um, also, what's available in your town? We don't. We are not around ocean, so maybe no. farm raises are the best. Fresh you know. salmon for sale. Exactly. Be skeptical. <laughs> exactly. And we know that farm raised salmon actually gives you same heart healthy benefits that wild salmon does. And interestingly, the PCB he talks about. Latest update says that PCBs are more common or more concentrated in wild salmon as compared to farm raised. So I say, pick salmon twice a week. It is good for your heart and buy it based on what flavor you like and you know what your budget is. Okay, good to know. Yeah, it fits, fits your budget, the all important thing right now with Absolutely. inflation. All right, we all know too much sodium can cause a number of health issues. So this next video goes in depth on different types of salt, Celtic versus table, listen. Table salt needs to be avoided. It's not good for us. A high quality Celtic sea salt is sodium in a clean form with up to 90 vital minerals included as well. <laughs> Uh, and that video is very lengthy. It's like almost sure. seven minutes long. So is Celtic salt healthier than table salt? Okay, so for our viewers, Celtic salt is simply salt that was evaporated on the coastal areas in France near Celtic Sea. That's that's okay. all it is. Now, the, she's talking about these minerals in Celtic salt that is better than table salt. And those minerals are so trace that they really don't yield any health benefits. So when you talk about magnesium and potassium and iron in Celtic salt versus iodized normal salt, okay. those are in small concentrations. You would really need to consume 200 teaspoons of Celtic salt to get your daily potassium. Any any so, benefit, just have the banana. Yeah, so salt <laughs> is salt, and Celtic salt is more expensive than normal salt. Normal salt is also iodized. We need iodine for a thyroid. So I will say stick to the salt that you like that's available in the stores and that's budget friendly. Don't throw out the Mortons that you've had for like six years up in right. the pantry. And, okay. and you know what, <laughs> go to your fruits and vegetables for these micronutrients that we are talking about, the magnesium and the iron, yeah. plenty of vegetables and fruits that give you that. Okay, all right, lastly, a viral video discussing the quality of fruit once it's blended, suggesting that it's less healthy once it's been through the Vitamix or the magic bullet perhaps, let's listen. 
mean, the difference between a banana that you eat and a banana you put in the blender is night and day. What? Putting a banana in a blender? Putting any fruit in a blender. First of all, you disperse the fiber that's in the fruit. So if you take a banana and you puree it and then you mix it with milk or nut milk or basically quadrupling its impact on blood sugar. Lindsay's over there laughing. Okay, so does blending fruit make it less healthy, Doc? It does not. So we need fruits one and a half to two cups of fruits every day for adults is recommended by American Heart Association. Now, as long as you blend these fruits in a blender without any added sugar, sure. without any maple syrup or honey, and sticking to your serving size, right? So one banana, if you eat one banana, and if you stick it in the blender, that's probably just as healthy. Now, here's the thing about some fruits with seeds in it, like blueberries okay. and raspberries, blackberries. Sure. Those seeds, when they are blended, they actually disperse more fiber and fat and protein. Now, when you blend a fruit with those seeded fruits, it decreases your sugar response. So let's say you take a banana and blackberries, yeah. your sugar response is going to be slightly lower than just a banana because those seeds actually lower your gastric emptying or digestion. So I say go for berries and blend them with your other whole fruit. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about That's messing it up, correct. throwing it in the blender. Okay, Dr. Sonal, thank you. She's gonna be. It's that time again to ask the experts. So here to answer your questions live on the air is Dr. Sonal Harder with Dignity Health Medical Group. But before we get to the questions, we did want to touch really quickly on the salt thing one more time. Yes, so we were talking, speaking of heart disease, right. salt is salt. And here's what I want our viewers to know. It's American Heart Association recommends about 2,300 milligrams per day and no more than that. And actually closer to 1,500. Average Americans consume about 3,000 to 5,000 milligrams per day. So we just have to be cautious of where the salt is coming from and try to reduce it as much as possible for better heart health. Exactly, okay, I did, I'm glad we got that in because that's sure. important. Our first question, uh, there's so many oils out there between olive, grapeseed, and canola. What's the healthiest oil to use for cooking? Okay, so recent, there was a recent publication that actually showed virgin olive oil happens to be the better oil out of all the oils, and that's because it has monounsaturated fats or oleic acid things that are good fat that is this is good fat, fat that we need for our heart health okay so i would stick to olive oil or virgin olive oil and and not necessarily extra virgin olive oil which can be a little bit more pricey we were talking about budget sure. earlier and extra virgin oil actually is good for salads but when it comes to cooking and heating i think the olive oil just regular olive oil is a good idea okay uh next from sharon in cave creek is there a best practice for speeding up metabolism is there <laughs> oh, Sharon, I love this question. So metabolism is determined by age, our hormones, as well as genetics. But here are some things that actually can boost your metabolism. One is high intensity workouts. So when you go from, you know, running really fast and then slowing down and going back up fast again for a few minutes, that okay. type of workouts. Strength training, building your muscle definitely boosts your metabolism. Eating adequate protein at every meal also can boost your metabolism. Sleeping well, so making sure that you're getting good night's sleep. Green tea has some studies that actually can boost metabolism. So those are some ways to actually boost your metabolism at a, at a baseline. And if you're a coffee drinker, maybe replace a cup of coffee a week with a green tea. Yeah. If, and actually if coffee also has some impact on metabolism, boosting it, but green tea has a little bit more evidence behind it. So. Okay, uh, another question coming in. What about frozen versus fresh vegetables? We talked about blending the fruit yes. and like, taking away the quality, which was untrue. Um, <laughs> frozen versus fresh. So actually, I, there is no evidence that says one is superior to the other. Here's how I would look at it. If you're bringing your vegetables from your backyard to your table, that's the best option. Okay. Or farm to the table, that's the best option because they're less processed. There's no delay in transportation. Some of the problem with fresh vegetables is the time that they are picked before they're ripe and then transportation to the grocery store. And sometimes it's actually, you know, Budget on budget, sure. like frozen vegetables and fruits seem to be a little bit more, more beneficial. They have the yeah. same nutrients as fresh vegetables. I prefer berries that are frozen because I feel like raspberries, blueberries go bad so quickly that frozen berries seem to actually have more. Yeah, you can't eat them after you're wasting yeah. and then back to the butt. Exactly. Okay. Uh, does drinking diluted apple cider vinegar in the morning help with your metabolism? There is very, very small data on apple cider vinegar in weight loss. I would not rely on this technique to actually boost your metabolism because we don't have solid evidence to back this up. Okay, but it can't hurt, I suppose. It can't hurt, exactly. Okay. All right, yes. good if question. If you take it in, rec you know, recommended uh, 
doses, yeah, sure. Doses. Yes. Okay, Doc. good. Great question. All right, great. Dr. Sonal Harder, thank you so much for being here on this Friday. Welcome back to 12 News at 4. This year, a study by CNBC and SurveyMonkey found that 53% of the Americans surveyed feel they're behind on retirement planning and savings. According to the U.S. Federal Reserve's Survey of Consumer Finances, roughly half of households have a retirement account and their median balance is about $87,000. Meanwhile, most Americans think they need a record $1.46 million to retire comfortably, and many households have financial priorities that compete with retirement savings. And with high inflation rates and credit card debt reaching all-time highs, what can Americans do to work toward a comfortable retirement? Let's ask the expert on this Money Saving Monday. Financial and consumer expert Angelica Prescott joins us to break down the biggest threats to that comfortable retirement. So what should we be considering off the top? Inflation, it doesn't sleep while we're retired. And even if it's just merely there, it can truly impact how we end up enjoying our retirement in the beginning years versus later. So make sure in your portfolio you have things that can focus on some growth to stay ahead of it. And maybe some more conservative investments too so that they kind of grow with you if you're a little bit younger planning retirement right now. Well, when you're younger, you have more chances to take on more growth. Okay. Because you have time for it to kind of do its fluctuation as you get older we become much more conservative so maybe ha have a little more aggressive portfolio yes. i suppose in the younger years mm -hmm. okay and let's talk about the excessive withdrawals if you're trying to kind of compensate and cover costs listen the funny thing is people forget that when they're retired every day is practically a saturday and they go into oh i'm just going to spend sixty thousand when i retire it ends up being one hundred and twenty thousand. so if you overdo it on the withdrawals you could truly hurt yourself in the long run oh my word okay <laughs> we got to move we got to move down the list um when we talk about market volatility obviously mm -hmm. we visit the Dow on a regular basis mm -hmm. and sometimes you're only seeing the red or the green but that is the volatility talk yes. about that when it's volatile that's, that's what we expect but the key thing you want to do is when you're doing those withdrawals and the market is down it can really hurt your portfolio to be pulling out in a down year so you want to make sure you have some cash or lower more conservative income investments to pull from so you don't have to touch those stocks while they're down and we know that sometimes if we're needing to withdraw that money it is for unexpected costs so what about building that emergency fund we say it it's and it so sounds key. cliche but it's so key it is because you know a car could just break down and you need that help or a medical expense and come in that's also another need that we need to look at yeah we know that the medical expenses can really start to pile up um, and you can't put that off mm -mm. so what about the health savings account and how does that sometimes play a role that does help health savings accounts allow for you to kind of buffer on those expenses mm -hmm. Medicare Medicare Advantage those are things that you need to look at to make sure that during your retirement you're not in a loss when it comes to covering for those health care needs it can seem daunting to maybe take away from the day-to-day -day needs and necessities mm -hmm. and put money away. Mm -hmm. How much is enough to put away to get started? Well, try to at least start with one month, two months, three months. I would never say to someone who doesn't have anything together, hey, do six months. Sure. It would be too overwhelming. So let's start with assessing really how much does it cost to be you per month, and let's start with one, two, and three months. Start small, and then selling stocks when they're a little bit cheaper. Is mm -hmm. that something that you would recommend? No, we never want to sell okay. stocks when they're down. We want to make sure that we get a profit on it because taxes on those, ta on those stocks are much more beneficial. The issue, though, is we want to make sure that we have something that can grow and stay ahead of inflation. Okay, and watch out for those fees associated with those withdrawals from mm -hmm. maybe the Roth or whatnot. Mm -hmm. All They're right, there. you hear Well, you've heard of the keto diet or the ketogenic diet where it's a low carb, high fat diet that's supposed to help you lose weight. The idea is to get more calories from protein and fat and less from carbohydrates. But what about a plant-based keto diet? What does that entail and how does it affect your body? And is it right for you? Let's ask the expert. Joining me now is Dr. Natasha Bouillon, National Medical Director of One Medical. All right, this is fascinating yes. to me. Mm -hmm. For someone who does not know much about the plant-based keto diet, explain what it is. Well, this is a popular twist on the vegan, you know, the typical keto diet. It's yeah. a vegan twist on that. So essentially, rather than getting a majority of the food sources from animals, people are getting a majority of their food sources from plant-based foods. Mm -hmm. Now, here's why it's tricky. So with the keto diet, there's a misconception that a lot of people just eat lots of animals and bacon yes. and butter. And then with the vegan diet, there's a misconception that people who are vegan eat a lot of starch. Right. And you know, when you think about crossing those two diets, it feels like so opposite. Is, there's nothing in common. And yes. so this is where there is some commonality. You know, the, the heart of it is the keto diet is mostly actually healthy fats. And so okay. it's really a matter of coming up with where can we get healthy fats that are derived from plant-based products mm -hmm. rather than just animals. Now, here's kind of the rules of the diet. Okay. One of the rules is that 70 
70% of the calories that you consume should be from fats. Mm. The other rule is around 25% of what you consume should be from proteins. Okay. And here's the really tough part. Yeah. Less than 5% of the calories that you consume should be from carbs. Ooh. And the reason why is if you ma maintain really, really low carbs, your body goes into this thing called ketosis where your body starts to burn more um, of the fat for fuel right. rather than burning glucose for fuel. Okay. And so that's how you, it leads to weight loss. Right. but it's hard to adhere to yes which again that's kind of the same mentality as just the keto diet right exactly. the low low carbs burning that fat yes and like okay. the trick is though with the keto diet a lot of people are able to get those uh, those sources from animals yeah and if you look at protein sources for people who are following a plant-based diet people who follow plant-based they're like well I get protein from greens right. beans and grains yeah well you can't really do that with keto because there's too many carbs in those foods right. and so it's really melding how do I get get enough protein without too many carbs. Right, so let's, that goes into the pros and cons, yeah, right? Because yeah. we know it's not for everybody. So let's start with the pros. Yeah, so it's not for everybody. I mean, one of the main pros is that it leads to weight loss. So anytime someone starts this diet, because it's so low in carbs, they oftentimes lose weight right off the bat. So that's yeah. a big benefit. Of course, if you do a vegan keto diet, the really nice thing is that it's animal friendly. So people right. like that. And then we also know a lot of plant-based diets have great impacts on chronic conditions. Yeah. Decrease heart disease, decrease diabetes, decrease high blood pressure. So we see that with basic vegan diets mm -hmm. and plant-based diets. There's not a lot of research specifically on vegan keto diets, but there is some research emerging. Okay. That being said, there are some cons yeah. as well. I think one of the biggest cons is that it takes a lot of planning, like thinking yeah. about what you need to eat, what follows the rules, what's low in carb. That takes a lot of planning ahead of time. You know, the other tough thing is that it does lead to nutritional deficiencies. When people eat this diet, they can't get enough vitamin D from foods. They have to take a supplement. People can't get enough omega-3 fatty acids. That also requires a supplement. Mm -hmm. Things like B6 and B12. So a mm -hmm. lot of people need to take supplements when they're doing this diet. And then I think ultimately there's a lot of unknowns in terms of research. We don't know what the long-term effects are. Short-term effects, people say they get constipation, but there still needs to be a lot more research on the long term. So that caught my eye with the constipation because I would think that with all the plant-based, lots of fiber, all that, why would you be constipated? Exactly, yeah. Well, so the, the thing is like when you're eating plant-based, you have to also have low sugar foods. And so when you look at things like, okay, I want to eat fruit, fruit is high in fiber. Right. Well, a lot of fruit is also high in sugar. And so you have to think like, I can't necessarily have bananas, but I can have things like berries. And so it's really reaching for the right low sugar foods Ooh. that also have fiber. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So let's give our folks some examples of low carb nutrient dense food. Yeah. That's exactly what people think about. So when we think about protein, one of the things I tell people, leafy green vegetables, people don't think about that, but things like spinach, kale, those are really great in terms of getting enough protein. Mm -hmm. You have to get creative with protein though. Things like nuts, seeds, sprinkling the food with yeah. nutritional yeast, obviously tofu, tempeh, those are good options for protein. Spirulina is also a nice option. Oh. So it's similar to seaweed. Okay. It has an interesting taste. Yeah. It's an acquired taste, but it is really nutrient dense. Okay. And then like I mentioned before, the low sugar things um, like berries, low sugar fruits. Right. And then here's the kicker, healthy fats. Yes. So searching for healthy fats, that might be, you know, full fat coconut. It might be things, um, you know, like avocados, Avocado, yeah. like olive oil. So mm -hmm. it's really takes a matter of planning because, you know, one thing fits the rule. It fits one rule, but it doesn't fit the other rule. Mm, interesting. Okay. We could go on and on about this. So interesting. All right. Now it's Ask the Expert here to answer your questions live on the air about a plant-based keto diet is Dr. Natasha Bouillon. Okay. Our first question is from Matt. Where do I start with getting good protein and how much do I need? That is such a great question, Matt. So people who follow the plant-based keto diet, they're getting about 25% of their calories from plants per day. So that's depending on your weight and everything. It's about 75 grams are coming from protein. Okay. And like we said before, it can't come from animal products. And so it comes from things like nutritional yeast, nuts and seeds. Um, and so that's definitely one source. The other one is looking at things like tofu and tempeh. Now, the caution that I will give people is having too much soy in your diet, especially for men, it's also not a good option because yeah. soy can increase levels of estrogen. And so when it comes right down to it, if you're having a hard time getting a protein, a lot of my patients will actually take a protein supplement, like a protein powder supplement, okay. because that's an easier way to get protein, especially on this restrictive diet. Yeah. Oh, good advice. Okay. Mary Helen says, I have two uh, excuse me, I have type 2 diabetes and I struggle so much with my weight. 
which keto is safe to start with and where can I go to get recipes for this diet? Mary Helen, that's such a great question because keto is a great diet for people with diabetes because it's low carb. That being said, it's not right for everybody with diabetes because one of the effects of keto that we've noticed in research is if people have high cholesterol, it tends to increase their LDL levels. So I would actually talk to your doctor first to see if it's the right diet for you. Between keto or vegan keto, Keto is easier okay. because you can eat things like eggs and cheese. Vegan keto is a lot more restrictive. Yeah. And in terms of recipes, you know, a lot of online recipes on Delish or Food Network. And you can also talk to a nutritionist. Um, I would actually say talking to a nutritionist is a great way to go because they can kind of tailor recipes that are right for you. Yeah, more niche. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Stephanie from Kingman says, is a plant-based keto diet okay for someone with chronic kidney disease? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's interesting. When people do a plant-based keto diet, what ends up happening is they actually can eat a little bit more salt in their diet oh. because their kidneys will end up disposing of more salt. So it's fine to do, but like I say with any diet, check with your doctor and see if that's right for you because if you end up getting a lot of processed foods by following a plant-based keto diet, then it might not be great for your kidneys. Yeah. So check in with your doctor on that one. But it's an interesting question about the salt. Okay, this is a good one from Maria from Scottsdale. If I have low blood sugar, missing carbs gives, uh, causes a drop in energy. What do you recommend? Such an interesting point, Maria. Okay, if you end up having a drop in energy because you don't get enough carbs, Keto is probably not the right diet for you because again, keto is so restrictive on carbs. You have to have less than 35 to 50 grams per day. That's really not many carbs. And for some people, they could not get through the day because yeah. they just don't feel like they have enough energy. So I would say, you know, start with other options for eating. You can do plant-based, Mediterranean, lots of other options you can talk to your doctor, but definitely it's not right for everybody. Yeah, oh, good advice. All right, Trish from Casa Grande says, is the keto diet safe for people with high cholesterol? since it does allow for a lot of meat. Yeah, Trish, this is such an interesting question you ask. This is a huge area of controversy in medicine yeah. because we've seen people who follow an animal keto diet will eat a lot of meats, and there's been research that show they have an increase in their cholesterol. And so a lot of doctors are saying, don't actually follow that type of diet. And yet with other folks who do keto, you end up seeing some other heart healthy benefits. I think it really depends on the individual person. Um, so I would say if you have high cholesterol or other medical conditions, talk to your doctor anytime you start a new diet just to see if it's right for you. Okay, that was so informative and we had so many viewer questions. Natasha, thank you so very much. Of course. Excellent topics. So every Wednesday this past month, if you've noticed, we've been dedicated to helping you improve your life. We've talked about PTG, post-traumatic growth, supporting your children's mental health, how journaling can help boost your mind, boosting your serotonin levels. And today on this Wellness Wednesday, we're gonna help you prioritize your mental well-being. So joining me now is life coach Juliana Lydon. Juliana, you know, we talk about your mental well-being and how important it is and you should prioritize it. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's common sense and it's a no-brainer, but why is it so hard? It's so hard because we just put it on the back burner. Yeah. We're just going through life in the fast lane mm -hmm. and we just absolutely don't always think about it. Yeah. And when we do, it's often too late at night or something. Right. And then we're falling asleep. And we're exhausted exactly. or we put people in front of ourselves, That's right? Which, Which is, is what common. We do. Yeah. So much at work as mothers always all that. okay yeah. so you've got five super easy ways to actually put our yes. mental well-being right now in gear the first step you say get up from your desk walk move at least four times a day yes because sitting is the new smoking Ooh. it really really is our bodies are made to move we have got to get up at least a minimum of four times a day walk around the office stretch yeah. do a few things but move okay move. so important the second one you say stop saying yes when you want to say no i'm guilty <laughs> guilty guilty aren't we all yes i know it took me a long time to get there i tell yes. you it is really hard but you know what you've got to start doing it Mm -hmm. Just do it. Yeah. Say no if you can't do it because it's going to end up driving you crazy and just taking all the energy away. Yeah, you do expend yourself you even do. more. and get frustrated. Yep. Number three, you say stand up to negative self-talk. Yeah. How often do we all catch ourselves saying something negative about ourselves? And I want you to think of it like this. So next time you do it, mm -hmm. I want you to replace it with something positive. Just oh. that fast, oh. no matter what it is. Oh, I just look awful today. Actually, I look beautiful. I feel good. 
Oh. Right? Just keep doing that yes. because it does shift. Okay. It does. I will practice that because I'm, okay. I'm terrible. Listen to me. I'm terrible at it. <laughs> okay. Next one, you say identify your non-negotiables. What do you mean by yes. this? So these are your deal breakers. Yeah. When you are going to say out loud in a relationship, a situation, maybe at work, I'm going to go to this point and then that's it. That's it. I am not going to tolerate mm. any more. Yeah. And we have to know what those are. It's kind of like a boundary. Right, right. So what is it? Set it. Get it going. Right. Dig your heels. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dig your heels. And then last one, you say, do a self-exploration evaluation. Yeah. Oh. Find out who you are. And mm -hmm. I have got a great question for people. Yeah. I say to them, what do you believe about yourself? And it really, you know, people really have to think, yeah. what is that belief? Right. And when you really start to think about that and you have to language it, I am what? Yeah. And make it into a sentence. It really makes you kind of think. But it, I was going to say, it makes you definitely pause and yes. make, you know, the wheels are turning like, yeah. how? Never really that? thought about that. Is that what somebody else thinks? Right. That's what you, you think your belief and is. believe yeah. in. Okay, I like that. Yeah. Okay, so you also have some coping strategies as well to help with our mental well being. Let's start with deep breathing. I do this a lot. I think I annoy my coworkers <laughs> when I do that at my desk. But yes, it's so yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It is so important. We don't know how to breathe, most of yeah. us. We breathe at this very shallow right. level, like, like you're up here in our chest. Right, yeah, up yeah. here in our chest. Mm -hmm. So taking that breath, it's the life force energy in us. Yes. We have got to use it and pull it in because when we do, everything's working better. Mm -hmm. Our blood's moving, the organs are pumping. So start practicing those deep breaths. Yeah, and you've talked about mindful meditations, but the last one you say sleep routine. Oh. That, I would say sleep can make or break you. It can, it can. So get into it so it's exciting to go to bed. Mm -hmm. You know, I have all these things I do before bed yeah. and it makes a difference. Some might take a bath, some might get the bed all, you know, situated, right. whatever it is. Set it up so it's exciting in yes. some way. Exciting it's and cozy. Yes. yes, exactly. Relaxing. Yes. Like, I can't wait to get in my bed. So good. I'm yeah. breathing deeply. Juliana, thank you. A new study published in the journal Child Development shows that empathy can actually be taught. Researchers studied 184 people for two decades, and through a series of interviews with mothers, teens, and one of the teens' friends, they found empathy shown by mothers predicts empathy shown by kids to their friends. Researchers found empathy from a mother to be most important at 13 years old. Moving ahead, teens who showed greater empathy went on to be more supportive of their own children. Psychologists say the key to being empathetic with your kids is fairly simple. Look and listen more. Well, it's time now to ask the expert here to answer your questions live on air about pri prioritizing mental health is Juliana Lydon. All right, Jamie from Phoenix says, as someone who has played the peacemaker role in my family my whole life, I have a difficult time setting boundaries with people in my life. I am also a people pleaser, which makes it even more difficult for me. Are there some small ways I can help myself with those needed boundaries in life? Yes, and I love the peacemaker. Yes. I just want to give a shout out to the peacemaker because they're so important. I know. And I get I get how they can get caught up in right. this kind of cycle. Right. But you just have to pick and choose and you have to begin. Mm. You just have to try. You can start out slow, small, find those little things where you're just going to start to practice. Right. Saying that, you know, I'm not going to tolerate this. You might say no, whatever it is. Just have to push yourself. Okay, step by step, baby yep. steps. All right. This viewer says, how do I tell my kids I need to take time out for me? Is that being selfish? What about my partner? It is not being selfish. I say all the time, the parents are the nucleus of the family. Mm -hmm. So it, it moves from that. Yeah. So it's so very important that we make decisions together yes. and that we take care of each other yeah. and we love one another because that's going to overflow to the kids. Right. So it is not selfish. It is necessary. Make that time together. Okay. Keep that connection alive and let your kids know, hey, you know, we need our time away too. Right. But what about the partner, though, being selfish when it comes to, 
you know, your partner and their needs versus your needs. How oh, do you yeah. how do you play yeah. that? Well, you're going to have to just kind of have that discussion too. Yeah. You know, open lines of communication. Mm -hmm. If you're feeling that something isn't working there and you're not, you know, in it, yeah. you you've got to make it really clear. Yeah. You got to bridge that gap. You do. Okay. Oh, that is tough. It All right. Is. Rachel says, "Are there any apps you recommend that help with mindfulness?" That's yes. Um, there's one called Calm and there's oh, one yeah, called Headspace. Okay. I actually have a hatch that I love that I sleep with every night uh -huh. and it does like biofeedback, relaxation. Um, it does bedtime story. Wow. All kinds of cool things. So there's so cool. many things out there okay. Okay, that you good can find. Know. This viewer says, I've heard journaling or meditation can help. Is that true? How long do I need to do it for every day? We've talked about yes, journaling. Yes, we talked about yes. journaling. Journaling is great. Get everything yeah. up here out of your head onto paper. Meditation, when we go into that place of silence, that's where all the creativity is born. Yeah. So the more you can do it, you can even do walking meditations. Even sitting for a little while in, in, in silence yeah. is super powerful. Okay. Again, bit by bit. Yeah, you just sparked that. another segment. <laughs> okay. the different ways to meditate. Yeah, yeah walking, sitting, right. all of that stuff. There's That's a lot of good ones. Yeah, we'll do that. Uh, this viewer says, when is it time to talk with an expert or my doctor? Mm. So when you notice you're just not yourself, mm. we all know when we get out of alignment, when we're just not happy, yeah. when day after day it's perpetuating this mood, these feelings. Right. And really step into getting some help, getting yeah. some support. Don't be There's afraid. There's so much out there, you yeah. know, and, and, you know, we can help you move through that. Yeah, and it's okay. It's okay. It's okay to get help. I mean, Everything. I feel like back in the day it was so taboo, right? Yes. But these days, I mean, it's, it's part of, it's just part of life, life and therapy. Life. Yeah. We all need support yeah. at some point in our lives. Right. It's all more accepted. Us. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Juliana, thank you so much. Yes, we so appreciate you. it. Welcome to 12 News at 4. Breaking this afternoon, former President Donald Trump has been found guilty on all counts in his New York hush money case. He's the first former president in history to be convicted of a crime. Shortly after the verdict was read, Trump huddled with his team just outside the courtroom. The jury found Trump guilty on all 34 felony counts of falsifying business records in connection with a hush money payment to adult film actress Stormy Daniels near the end of the 2016 presidential campaign. In comments to the press on his way out of the courthouse, Trump maintained his innocence and made it clear that he believes the verdict will not stop his run for the White House. This was a disgrace. This was a rigged trial by a conflicted judge who was corrupt. It's a rigged trial, a disgrace. They wouldn't give us a venue change. We were at 5% or 6% in this district, in this area. This was a rigged, disgraceful trial. But the real verdict is going to be November 5th by the people. And they know what happened here, and everybody knows what happened here. You have a Soros-backed DA and the whole thing. We didn't do a thing wrong. I'm a very innocent man, and it's okay. I'm fighting for our country. I'm fighting for our Constitution. Our whole country is being rigged right now. This was done by the Biden administration in order to wound or hurt an opponent, a political opponent. And I think it's a, just a disgrace. And we'll keep fighting, we'll fight till the end, and we'll win. Because our country's gone to hell. We don't have the same country anymore. We have a divided mess. We're a nation in decline, serious decline. Millions and millions of people pouring into our country right now from prisons and from mental institutions, terrorists, and they're taking over our country. We have a country that's in big trouble. But this was a rigged decision right from day one with a conflicted judge who should have never been allowed to try this case, never. And we will fight for our Constitution. This is long from over. Thank you very much. Joining me now is criminal defense attorney Hector Diaz of Diaz Law. Hector, what was your reaction to this guilty verdict? I mean, this is a historic moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is one of these where you're going to sit back, you're going to think, you know, where was I at when I heard this? I right. know I was in my car listening to this verdict. And, you know, this first time that a president 
former president is a convicted felon. Yeah. And it's just, it is. And candidate. Yeah. Current, current candidate. It, it is shocking. It's shocking. I, I think we're going to be talking about this for months and months and months leading up to sentencing. Right. Did you see that he would be found guilty on all 34 counts? No. No, I thought that you'd get a split verdict based yeah. on, you know, when the jury came back and they said, hey, we need some time to go over the jury verdicts. The thought there was that they were going to go over each one because typically if it's guilty on all counts, pretty quick. Right? So the thought was, okay, split verdicts. Maybe they find him guilty on some of the, where you have stronger evidence, where mm -hmm. he signed some of these checks that were ultimately submitted. Maybe those were the counts that they were going to find him guilty on. But all counts, yeah, that's, that is a bit surprising. Could he be looking at jail time? Um, could he? Yes. Uh, the maximum sentence, I think, is four years prison. Will he? Unlikely. Mm -hmm. Unlikely. Uh, you know, he has never, of course, never been convicted of a felony. There's probation, which is an appropriate sentence here. Um, his lawyers will undoubtedly, there are, there's going to be a slew of motions that get filed before even sentencing, uh, you know, asking for motion for new trial. There's all sorts of issues they're going to raise after he's sentenced, which I know we have a date in July. July um, 11th. Unlikely that that date will go forward. Okay, so that was the date that he was going to be sentenced. So you don't think that that, that sentencing date of July 11th will happen. There will be numerous motions probably in appeals. Absolutely. Well, the appeals will come after his sentence, but there are some motions that his lawyers will likely make pre-sentencing um, in terms of the verdict. And they'll, they're just standard motions that they're going to have to file, right? And so that's going to take some time. The court has already set a deadline in June for those motions to be filed. I, I expect these, these attorneys are going to ask for additional time mm -hmm. and reset the sentencing date. Well, and hasn't that been the case, I mean, very typical of these Trump cases where it's just, you know, prolonging that time, asking for more time, trying to delay it and this, as we get into election season? Uh, absolutely. I, I will say, though, it, this, asking for additional time for sentencing um, on a complex white collar case isn't unheard of. And so mm -hmm. this is a kind of situation where I, I, I just don't see that date going. Hmm. OK, let's talk about, though, that sentencing phase. Mm -hmm if and when eventually it happens, right? What will happen? Guide us through. There's some lead up. So he actually will have to meet with a representative of the probation department. There's what's called a pre-sentence interview in New York. So he's going to have to sit down with a uh, pre-sentence writer is what we call him. And they're going to ask him a lot of questions about his background, about his finances, about his associations. And it's going to be interesting in mm -hmm. terms of how that interview goes on because he's going to be there. He'll have his lawyer present. That information gets condensed in, condensed in what's called a pre-sentence report. That gets submitted over to the court. The judge reviews it. And the probation department will make a recommendation based on the information they've collected about former President Trump in terms of what they believe is an appropriate sentence in light of the information they have, the offenses he committed. There's, it's just, it is really odd that we're sitting here talking about, you know, former President Trump is going to have to go through what we in, in, in this industry call a PSR interview. And it's, he's going to have to do it. Okay. I'm wondering, would he be able to vote? Great question. In uh, his, resides in Florida, one of the, you know, rights that he's going to lose now as a convicted felon is his right to vote. And Florida has a rule that you have to have fulfilled your sentence before you can go ahead and reinstate it. Um, unlikely he's going to fulfill his sentence by the time we, you know, he's there. At the by the time in November. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we have never seen anything like this. A former president and a current presidential candidate convicted in a criminal case ever, let alone just months from the election. Today's verdict obviously has legal implications for Trump, but it also has a lot of political implications for him, especially right here in Arizona as a swing state. We want to bring in 12 News political insider Bram Resnick into this conversation. Bram, I got to get your reaction. Guilty on all 34 counts. Uh, I'll tell you, I had no expectations about what the jury would do for one reason. Uh, I think Hector might agree with this. You have to be in the courtroom. This yeah. wasn't televised. We didn't see it. Great point. You, don't wa you can't watch the jury. You can't hear the arguments. It's really tough to filter through the cable coverage mm -hmm. and try to decide, oh, I think they're going to acquit. I think they're going to convict. That's a great point. You're in a yeah. bubble. Those jurors were in a bubble. There's only certain evidence that they can hear. We have you know, the benefit of watching CNN or this, cha right. you know, Channel 12, all these other networks that are filtering tons and tons of information. And that's, you know, that's not what these jurors hear. And they may have focused on very minute pieces they uh, you know, that they felt carried the burden. Right. And, and so. give the jurors credit. They're very thoughtful yeah. people. They take their jobs very seriously.
Yeah, and they deliberated for, for you know, a good amount of time. What, a, a week or so? Or? Yeah, it, it is interesting, the amount of time here. For a complex white-collar case, yeah. you know, it's not unheard of to have them deliberate for a week. So this is kind of a, a you know a verdict that came back a little quicker than I expected, given right. the the counts, given the information. But uh, those jurors want to get it right. They they want to be considerate of the evidence, the time that's putting you know that's being put into it. But I think at the end of the day, what really may have tipped the scales here in favor of the state was the manner in which Trump went about his defense. Mm. And that's an issue. I mean, we're going to be debating this as you know lawyers for for some time here. In how he presented it and ultimately how he focused on Stormy Daniels and right. and really kind of, you know, cross-examined Stormy Daniels in that manner. You didn't really have to do that. And I have to think, too, as a juror, I mean, we are talking probably the most highest profile case, right? right? I mean, this is so historic. It is unprecedented. The weight and the gravity on those jurors. I mean, I can't even imagine. But n not just that. Think about what's happened to jurors in other cases. They are tracked down. Their mm -hmm. opponents will try to find out who they are, their identities, reach them on social media, perhaps even threaten them, threaten the judge. We've seen all this before. This is a new phenomenon, frankly, of the Trump era, these kinds of attacks. So those jurors and their families have to be c concerned about that right now. Absolutely. I mean, considering how divisive this has been with with the candidates and it's it has just been really really ugly Absolutely. Yeah. Um, talk about the reaction that we have seen really from everyone elected officials especially yeah I, I got four uh, responses here it's fairly predictable it's here first Gina Swoboda chair of the Arizona Republican Party issued this statement quote this conviction is a blatant assault on the principles of justice President Trump's trial was marred by bias and a predetermined agenda, stripping him of the fair trial to which every American is entitled to. Now, Carrie Lake, she's the front runner in the Republican primary for the U.S. Senate and a staunch Trump defender. She had this to say, quote, we just witnessed the most egregious example of election interference and an outright mockery of the rule of law in the 246 year history of our republic. This entire process, right down to the verdict, has itself been nothing but a shameful political stunt, I would add, are we are, this is the 248th year uh, of the uh, United States. The verdict itself has been nothing but a shameful political stunt. And Congressman Ruben Gallego, the likely Democratic nominee for the U.S. Senate, tweeted, I respect our justice system and the rule of law. The process played out and we should always demand accountability from our elected leaders. You might be wondering, what did the White House say? There was this simple statement. We respect the rule of law and have no additional comment. I should add, President Joe Biden and his family have gathered in Delaware today to mark the ninth anniversary of his son, Bo Biden's death. We know how close the president was to his son and what this day means. So this day, doubly significant, right. personally and politically, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for the president. And talk about the polls, too. The polls are interesting. There's going to be a lot of polling over the next few days, a rush to poll voters. What's your reaction? What we know leading up to it is there was significant attention being paid on cable TV. Here's a poll that was done in February in Arizona. This is the last one I'm aware of. Asked about all the, uh, all the trials, the indictments President Trump, uh, former President Trump is facing. 93% said they knew about them. Among Democrats, 65% believed he was guilty, 6% not guilty. Republicans, 56% not guilty, 11% guilty. That's a somewhat ambivalent, more ambivalent than you would expect. Independent voters said 34% guilty, 26% not guilty. That, pump from, that poll from Noble Predictive Insights. And again, we're going to see a lot of these polls yeah. over the next few days. Now and, that and, the conviction and any, is real. Right, and anything can change too. People change their minds. Also, you know, I want to close this with from both a legal perspective as well as a political perspective especially since you say you know there's so much that will happen before that sentencing right how do you think this will affect his campaign we don't know i i, I wonder how will this affect his campaign and how will this affect donald trump this is a heavy weight to bear 34 felonies i have to wonder if you've been reading his personal history, what his father Fred would have said to him right now. He told Donald Trump, be a killer. 
He's not a killer right now. Uh, so emotionally, that has to have some effect, wear him down, perhaps. We'll see what the voters say. And again, in the world we live in, mm -hmm. How, what's the timeline on this story, right? right. How right. long will this last? 24, 48 hours? Remember how the Access Hollywood tape right. in 2016, October, was going to doom his candidacy? It didn't. But timeline-wise, I mean, November is going to be here before we know it. For sure. And there are other days. He has a Republican convention that's coming up, and he's right. got to deal with the fact that his opponent, at every opportunity, is going to say, this is a convicted felon. Yeah. You want your president to be a convicted felon. And he knows, he knows that he's going to take a lot of hits in terms of that. Um, and it is. It's got to take its emotional toll. Well, and with all these motions and, you know, the sentencing, the appeal, I mean, that's got to, that's got to be a huge burden, if you will, trying to become president. Absolutely. He is, as he called it, the ice box there in, in being in court in New York. And he, that's the last place he wants to be. Now he's got to come back. That's a really good point. You have to remember, for folks in court, that is the last place they ever want to be. It is humiliating. It is the worst day of their life. And now what he's going to have to go through with all the pre-sentencing, mm -hmm. that happens stuff we never see that goes on every day in our court right. system. People processed all the time. Now he is just one of them, yeah. a convicted felon who's going to have to talk to a probation officer. Mm -hmm. It's going to be long those, and tedious. Those are terrible days. Yeah. All right, Bram, thank you very much. Now to another big national case, Chad Daybell's triple murder trial. The jury reaching their verdict just a few hours ago, guilty on all counts. The so-called doomsday author is now convicted of murdering his wife, Lori Vallow's two kids, Ty Lee and JJ, who used to live right here in the Valley. He's also convicted for killing his first wife, Tammy Daybell. 12 News journalist Erica Stapleton has been on this case for the past four years. Erica, this verdict came down quickly. Yeah, Tram, the jury got the case just yesterday afternoon, so they had it for less than 24 hours. And what this means is that prosecutors really laid out their case clearly, and the jury was able to use that evidence to come to their decision. To give you some background, this trial took some time, 31 days of testimony and arguments over the course of the past two months, each side pulling out all the stops in their cases, the state driving home their case that this was about money, power, and sex, and that Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow's dark religious beliefs led them to have an affair and get rid of anyone who could get in the way of their relationship. The defense actually calling Chad a victim, blaming the crimes on Lori Vallow and her brother, but in the end, the jury was quick to convict on eight charges, including those three counts of first-degree murder. In regards to count two of the amended indictment, is Chad Guy Daybell not guilty or guilty of first-degree murder of Tylee Ryan? Guilty. In regards to count four of the amended indictment, is Chad Guy Daybell not guilty or guilty of first degree murder of Joshua Jackson Ballow? Guilty. Question number six. In regards to count six of the amended indictment, is Chad Guy Daybell not guilty or guilty of first degree murder of Tamara Tammy Daybell? Guilty. Let's take another legal deep dive and bring Hector back into the conversation. Hector, we are talking less than 24 hours for this verdict to come down. Were you surprised at how fast this came in and guilty? No, not surprised. Um, you know, the prosecutors in this case had a, you know, a trial involving Lori uh, Vallow. And so they, they had a, a really good appreciation of the evidence. Mm -hmm. They, I think, also likely made adjustments in terms of what was going to be impactful here to connect Chad Daybell to this crime, mm -hmm. recognizing that he was likely going to try to lay the blame on, you know, his co-conspirator. Right. And so there was just a lot of evidence that connected Chad Daybell to beyond just simply that somehow he was a patsy or, or went along with this. So it's just, it is, it's interesting, um, you know, that, that this has come to a conclusion. Mm -hmm. And Tram, I'll say I wasn't surprised either. I was yeah. maybe surprised more at how quickly they came to that verdict, but I wasn't surprised that it was guilty on all counts, just because, again, as Hector, Hector said, they had, you know, this blueprint looking at Lori Vallow's case. She was convicted in this case on all counts last year. And some of the evidence that was presented, there are images, there were details about a lot of disturbing details that really stick with you as a juror. So I'm sure they considered all of that during their deliberations, and it was just a lot of evidence that stacked up. And usually, you know, when a verdict comes down this fast. I mean, usually, is it guilty? Well, it's usually, in, in those situations, I'll, I'll tell you, I've, I've been doing this long enough to where I try not to read the tea leaves right. in terms of 
But there is always sometimes uh, on the defense side that that's going to be a not guilty. So maybe his lawyers thought, you know, there was some issue there. You know, did they go back and look at the evidence and, and you know, but there's the other side of it. Sometimes they come back, right. they've heard the evidence and it's guilty. Yeah. Uh, it just depends on the kind of case. And here, I think there was so much evidence here that connected, you know, this individual to, to acting beyond just simply you know, that he was going along somehow and, you know, didn't have any involvement right. beyond, you know, being with Miss Vallow. Mm -hmm. uh, that just didn't, didn't fly. What was interesting to Erica and I, you know, his demeanor, how stoic, how emotionless he was throughout the entire throughout trial. Throughout the trial, and keep in mind, he never testified. We haven't heard much from him on any of this. So to mm -hmm. see him sitting there, even through the verdict being read, I mean, is that... Is that something, I'm just wondering as a criminal defense attorney, is that something that you would tell your clients or discourage? You know, I, I try to tell my clients when you're waiting there. It's a very stressful when you're waiting for a verdict and you know, you are, you're you hoping for that not guilty based on you know the evidence and you're sitting there and the jury comes in and mm -hmm. you never know how, how a defendant's gonna act. You tell them, hey, listen, let's show respect to the court, to the jurors that are gonna come in. Don't, you know, if it if it's, doesn't go our way, right. you know, we wanna be, you know, um, to maintain our composure. Okay. And so that may have been some of the instruction. Who knows? This person could be medicated for all we know yeah. in terms of, you know, he is incarcerated and, and there are a lot of things going on. Um, but yeah. I, I do want to add quickly, Hector and Tram, that this isn't over just yet. We're now moving into the sentencing phase of this case. Chad Daybell could be facing the death penalty here and the same jury that just convicted him on all counts will be deciding if the death penalty is just on those murder and conspiracy charges. So I'm wondering if the speed in which they convicted him here might have any bearing on a decision. Always plays into it. For it the death plays penalty. Into it. it also, to, to your point, in terms of how he acted, that was in front of the that same jury that's mm -hmm. gonna decide his fate. They are gonna sit and weigh aggravating mitigating factors now. It becomes a mini trial. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna hear from other witnesses in terms of Chad Daybell's actions. There's gonna be evidence that didn't come in during the trial about his character. Um, and they're gonna have to decide. They only have to find one aggravator in terms of, of whether to impose the death penalty. And that could be, for instance, the, the nature of this crime, that it was cruel and depraved. Mm -hmm. it, you know, the, was there some kind of financial motive you know, backing this? We heard about some insurance issues there. So um, it's gonna be interesting to see how it plays out. I wouldn't be surprised, given the facts that we know about this case, that they do find um, Chad Day Bell here and impose the death penalty. And that portion will continue tomorrow morning, so it's right. going to be moving right yes. along. Right. All right. Erica, thank you so much. Hector, I know you're going to stay with us for even more cases. Now to a Valley man who runs a nonprofit that helps the homeless is in a legal tangle with Tempe. Austin Davis founded an organization called AZ Hugs. Every Sunday, he organizes a picnic at Papago Park to give food to those who need it. But the city says he needs a permit because they were getting complaints from neighbors about excessive trash and drug paraphernalia left behind after the picnics in the park. Last December, Davis applied for that permit but was told he had to stop his picnics while they review. Well, he didn't. A month later, his application was denied. The city says Davis defied numerous written and verbal notifications about the need for a permit. Davis was charged with multiple misdemeanors. So let's take a legal deep dive into this case. Hector, here's a guy who just wants to help the homeless. Why does he need a permit? You know, most cities have regulations um, that you're required to get a permit if you're gonna do some kind of like a party at a park. Mm. You're gonna take up a ramada. You're, you know, because other people might wanna use that space. Okay. They actually charge you a fee mm -hmm. um, and then you're able to, you know, to use the park. And so, you know, their city ordinances, every city has them right. in place. And, and here's a situation where somebody, I think probably the city looked at it and said, okay, you know, we want you to do this and have yeah. your, your picnic, but we, we can't make an exception for you here, right. you know, because everybody has to go through this route to do right. this. Right, and the fact that he still kept doing it when he was supposed to stop while they were reviewing that, that probably didn't help. Did not help, yeah. did not help. You know, the misdemeanors are criminal offenses. Um, you know, you can get up to six months in jail depending on the, the type of misdemeanor it is. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, when you continue, you know, to, while these city ordinances, some of them violations might be civil, right. when you engage in additional conduct that might be um, disorderly or you know, public nuisance or something, that goes into the criminal realm. Mm. Okay, so apparently Tempe prosecutors have dismissed most charges without prejudice. Explain what that means. Without prejudice means that they are dismissed, meaning you don't have to go to court. 
but they can refile them at a later date. So what oh. the city might be doing is they might be talking, you know, I don't know if he has a lawyer, they might be conversing with his counsel, okay. they might be talking with the city attorney in terms of the ordinance, is this ordinance valid? There are a lot of things that might be happening mm -hmm. and, and they're dismissing it so that they can have time to review it and then if they make a decision can refile those criminal charges at a later date. Okay, got it. Thanks for watching. Be sure to follow our YouTube channel for more content and watch the Ask the Experts segment weekdays at 4 p.m. and right here on our 12 Plus app.